Okay, so welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about fuses. Now you may be thinking, well, fuses, there's nothing to talk about. They're uh, easy. You, When they blow, you replace them and you're all set to go and that's about it. Um, well, no, absolutely not. Actually, fuses are surprisingly complicated devices. And in order to understand them, you need to know some things that a lot of people aren't aware of. We're going to talk about those things in this and hopefully it will help you a lot. So when you look at a fuse, it looks like a very simple device, right? It's got some metal caps on the ends and it's got this glass tube and you can look inside the tube and see this, what looks like a little wire uh, going between both ends of the tube. And um, that's about it, right? There's really nothing else to it. Well, no, not at all. There's a lot to it. So basically, what is a fuse? In the very simplest form, it's a piece of wire that melts when current gets too high and opens the circuit to stop the current. And you've got your current running through the fuse out to some circuit. And when that current through that wire gets to be too high, it will melt the wire and open the circuit so whatever is down in your circuit doesn't get damaged. Because clearly, if there's a lot of current coming through this wire suddenly, something's going on in your circuit. So for example, let's say you've got your DC power supply hooked up to this circuit with some components, and you're running it through a fuse. And what happens, you apply voltage to the circuit and current flows through the fuse. If something happens in the circuit, one of the symptoms of bad stuff happening in your circuit is the current may start to go up over a normal value. And the fuse's job is to sense when that current is getting too high and it automatically somehow melts the wire inside the fuse, which opens the circuit and disconnects the, the source, the, in this case, the DC power, from the circuit. So whatever's going on here in the circuit stops melting or stops short circuiting because you've disconnected the supply. So that's the job of the fuse to protect your circuit. The reason for fuses is to protect equipment because high currents usually indicate a problem and can generate a lot of heat and cause damage. Fuses are everywhere. This is something you might see when you walk out of your house and walk down the street and you see on a power pole, you see your power company has got this tank here, um, which is a transformer. And its job is to transform the high voltage that the power company uses, maybe 7,000 volts or 12,000 volts or whatever. The job of the transformer is to convert that into, at least here in the US, like 120 and 240 volts that you can bring into your house. And if you look up here on the right, this is a fuse. And the power company uses them everywhere. Electronic equipment uses them everywhere. They're everywhere. Fuses are very important. The wires that come to feed this transformer first go through this fuse and then into the transformer. And over here, and we discussed this in my video on ATX power supplies and protection on ATX power supplies, very much like your power company. Here we also have over voltage protection. So the fuse gives you overcurrent protection, and this um, MOV, or lightning arrestor, gives you overvoltage protection. So what happens if the current going through this fuse and into this transformer exceeds a certain value because something's going on in the transformer, maybe there's short circuit, a winding problem, or maybe on the 120 or 240 volt secondaries, you get a short circuit, maybe a bird short circuits the wires, uh, this fuse will sense that overcurrent and it will melt. Now the problem with this fuse is that if you're down on the street and you're looking up on the pole, you don't know that this fuse has melted. There's no glass tube and it's basically uh, something happened inside, but there's no way for the utility to te technician to find out, oh, that fuse is blown, I need to fix it. What this is designed to do is when this blows, it automatically will swing down on this hinged connector right here and give a visual indication to the technician that, hey, something happened, this fuse blew, something happened either in this transformer or on the wires, you need to go fix that problem and then you're gonna have to replace the fuse when you're all done. Uh, in our case, if you're, if you're working with bench equipment and you've got fuses like these, you can now understand why we have this glass tube 
So you can look inside and see some black uh, melted wire and say, oh, the fuse is blown. So it gives you good visual indication. That's not always true. Here is a fuse. It's a half amp fuse that I applied one amp to for over 30 seconds and it never blew. So I put twice as much current as it's rating and it never blew. Um, it's still intact, but you can see it, it probably got damaged because it, it started melting and put out a lot of smoke inside the fuse, but it still was working. So that's something to know about fuses. It's one of the characteristics of fuses. Um, they can start melting, but still be intact, but damaged. Very important to know. Let's look into this wire inside this fuse and see what we can figure out. Now, um, here is again my half amp fuse, and this is a 250 volt fuse, and you look at the wire in here, and I took a, some stranded wire that I use for uh, bench testing, and I took one strand of that wire, and notice that, you know, that wire strand is about the same size as this fuse element. So, huh, maybe, maybe this fuse is just a piece of wire that's in between two metal caps. Well, it, let's look into this and see what's the difference between this wire inside the fuse and something like a standard 36 AWG wire. So what we're going to need to do is figure out how does this wire element work? Is it just like a piece of wire or is it got some other magic in there that helps it to figure out how much current is flowing and when to blow, when to melt? Let's step back a, a bit and look at some of the concepts involved with fuses. If you're familiar with incandescent light bulbs, uh, you'll know that um, for a light bulb, you've got a wire coming in here, going through this, what's called a filament, and then it goes out the other side, kind of like a fuse, right? And current flows, when you turn on the light bulb, current flows and flows through the fil filament and then back out. But for some reason, the filament heats up and emits light. And if you've ever mistakenly touched a light bulb after it's been on, you know it also generates a lot of heat. So that current flowing through the filament generates heat and light to light up your room. But this wire that's connected to the um, socket of the light bulb doesn't seem like it's generating heat and light. So what's different about this filament from a normal piece of wire. Why is this filament generating heat and light, but this other wire isn't? It's the same question we have to deal with with our fuse. We know now that the fuse needs to generate heat in order to melt. That's how you're gonna melt this thing. You're gonna heat it up, and at some point that wire is gonna have so much heat that it's going to melt. So, how does it work? Well, we can step back. We know about um, power. And we know that power is a function of how much current is flowing through something with a resistance. And it's equal to the amount of current squared times the amount of resistance that it's flowing through. So if there's a current flowing through this fuse element, then we know that it's generating power based on how much current flowing how much current is flowing and how much resistance this element has we know that if you increase the current the power is going to go up very quickly because it's i squared so if you go from one amp to two amps you're increasing the power by two squared or four so it's going up very quickly and also the resistance is a factor so if you increase the current and or you increase the resistance you're generating more power you can see for a given amount of current, if you increase the resistance of the wire, you should be generating more power. We also know that total energy is the power generated over a period of time, right? So power is like how many watts per second you're generating. Total energy is how many watts you've generated over a period of time. And the formula for that is power, or I squared R, times the time that you have been generating that power. So the total energy generated in this fuse element is equal to the current times the resistance of the element times the time, how much time that, has, that current has been flowing. So now we got a little bit of an idea maybe how this thing is working. Uh, it's relying on the current and the resistance and the time. 
So let's compare. Let's take a look at a piece of 36AWG wire and see how it compares with the fuse element. What's different? So for a typical 36AWG wire, ballpark values are the diameter of this thing is about 0 0.005 inches, or otherwise known as 5 mils. And if you look up a table for the resistance of 36AWG wire, it's about 400 ohms for every 1,000 feet of wire. Now, we don't have 1,000 feet. We've got maybe one inch. So if you do the math, you find out that that's more like 0.03 ohms for one inch of 36 wire. So if this in this fuse you had just a piece of number 36 wire, it would be 0.03 ohms, something like that, okay? So let's calculate the power generated for, say, one amp being pushed through this fuse. So I squared R is one amp times 0.03 ohms for this one inch which gives us 30 milliwatts of power or 0.03 watts of power generated by one amp flowing through this. And this is a half amp fuse. So we're talking about twice its rated current. We're generating about 0.03 watts. You might think 0.03 watts, that's not a lot. How, is that really going to melt? You know, if I've got one amp and a half amp fuse, that should like blow the fuse, right? It should melt this but it's 0.03 watts. That doesn't seem like a lot. Well, let's take a look on the bench at the resistance of this fuse element and see how it compares. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my DC power supply, you see here, and I am going to generate 0.2 amps of constant current coming out of this, and I'm going to feed it through my fuse, my half amp fuse, and I'm going to measure the voltage across the fuse. So if I know I have 0.2 amps going through it, if I measure the volts, I can do volts over 0.2 amps, and that will tell me the resistance. The resistance is a function of amps and temperatures, so it's just going to give us a ballpark, but at least it will give us an idea of how much resistance this half amp fuse element has. Now to do this, um, I talked, I did a review of this uh, Dr. Meter power supply a while back, a uh, very popular review, and one thing I noticed was that when you turn this power supply on in constant current mode, it will immediately generate a very, very high voltage for a brief amount of time. And then it will recover and say, oh, wait a minute, I don't, for 0.2 amps of constant current, I don't need to generate like 10 or 15 volts. I only need a few volts. So it, it suddenly recovers back to where it, it drops the voltage. So in order to allow for that initial pulse of voltage and not blow the fuse when I turn this on, I've got a bypass switch that I put across the fuse. So what I'll do is I'll turn on the DC supply with the switch closed and it will bypass the fuse and there won't be any current going through the fuse. It will go through the switch. And then when this thing is settled out, I'll open the switch and then I can measure the actual current flowing through the fuse. So. Uh, very important thing to remember when you're working with fuses. Um, be careful of your bench supplies and your other sources, whether they're doing generating transients that might blow your fuse. So that's what we're going to do. We'll go to the bench and see what we get. Okay, so I've got my DC power supply here. It's off. I've got my power switch and this is on. I've got my fuse holder here on this terminal. And basically the DC power terminals are coming in and the fuse is across it and also the switch is across it. So when I've got this on, it's basically bypassing the fuse and it's just going from the power supply through the switch and back. Now I've got my meter. I'm going to measure the DC voltage across this fuse when I have the current flowing. I'm going to start this up and I'm, I've got it set for 0.2 amps of constant DC current. And it's initially going to go through the switch, then I'll open the switch and the current will then be shunted through the fuse and then I can measure the voltage across the fuse. So let me turn this on and you can see I've got 0.2 amps, which is now going through the switch and I will screw in the fuse and I will measure the voltage across the fuse. So you can see we've got 90 millivolts across the fuse and it's got 0.2 amps through it. So I'll shunt it again. So now I know I've got 90 millivolts. 
Okay, so here's the results of what we got. Um, we generated about 85 millivolts across the fuse at 0.2 amps. So we can calculate the resistance of the fuse was 0.085 or 85 millivolts over 0.2 amps or about 0.4 ohms. All right. So 0.4 ohms compared to our one inch of 36 AWG is 0.4 over 0.03. That's like 14 times more resistance in one inch of this fuse element than in one inch of 36 AWG. So you can see that this fuse element is a whole lot different from this 36 AWG in that it's got a lot more resistance. And if you figure out the power generated through this fuse, you can see it's one times one times 0.43 ohms or 0.43 watts. So now you're getting into a range where you can start worrying about things melting. 0.43 watts is fairly um, sizable. Now I did a video a while back on electronics thermals. I encourage you to watch that. It talks about um, power and heat and how those are related and what some typical values are. I give you a very good idea about um, thermals and heating and temperatures in electronic components. Here you can see clearly there's a difference between the fuse element and a piece of typical wire. So now we know that the fuse melting depends on amps, the current flowing through, the resistance of this fuse element, and what else? Is there something else that's involved in determining whether this thing is going to melt and when it's going to melt? Well, we talked before, we said total energy. Remember, power is just the immediate energy generation, but it doesn't tell you how much is generated over a period of time. We need to figure out total energy, which is, uh, which is amps times resistance times time, to see how much total energy is generated in this element to determine when and if it's going to melt. There's a very important concept you need to be aware of when you're dealing with fuses. And it involves equipment capabilities. What can equipment withstand in terms of high temperatures, thermal um, capability? So equipment can generally withstand high current for only a short time, right? Because high currents are very dangerous. They generate a lot of heat very quickly. Remember I squared R times T. T is short, but I squared gets really big really quick. Um, but with low currents, eh, not so bad because it's a low current. I squared is lower, much lower. So you can withstand that for a longer time. And again, temperature rises over time. Temperature doesn't rise immediately unless you've got some very, very, very big currents. So these concepts you need to understand when you're talking about fuses and equipment. This brings up the issue of what are called time current curves. And these are very, very important when you're talking about fuses. They define how a fuse is going to operate. And they also define the capabilities of equipment, what it can handle, how much current it can handle for how long. So these time current curves, you really, really need to be aware of them and understand how they work. So for example, um, this is a what's called a transformer thermal damage curve. And this defines for a typical uh, certain size of a transformer, how much current it can withstand for how long before it starts to get damaged by overheating. So on the bottom of this graph, I've got multiples of rated amps. So if I've got a 100 amp piece of equipment, this tells me how many times of 100 amps that you're putting through the transformer. So here is 10, so that means 10 times 100 or 1,000 amps. Here's 1 times 100 or 100 amps. So this tells me multiples of rated amps. On the Y or vertical axis, it's how many seconds it can withstand that amount of current. So here I can say it can withstand 10 times rated current for a little over, here's 10 seconds. So maybe 10 or 12 seconds. After 12 seconds, it's going to get thermally damaged according to this curve. So this tells you for, for example, 20 amps, which is this next line here, it can only withstand 20 amps for right here, which is one, two, three seconds. So 20 amps for three seconds, 10 amps for 
10 seconds or 12 seconds. And then here's two amps for a thousand, over a thousand seconds. So the more current, the less time it can withstand it. And for very small currents or relatively small currents, this is twice rated current. It can withstand that for a long period of time, okay? So very, very important um, graph to understand because a fuse has a, a very similar time current curve that defines how long it will take to melt for a certain amount of current. So this is a fuse time current curve for a half amp fuse, okay? And this is a um, quality fuse. I think they cost a dollar a piece. Fairly expensive, but they come with a time current curve that defines how much current for how much time. So again, a half amp fuse. So you can see at one amps, it can go for just under a second and then it will blow, okay? So one amp for one second, um, two amps for 0.1, maybe 0.12 seconds. And then you can see over here, um, this is 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0.6 amps. Again, it's a half amp fuse, so 0.6 amps, it looks like it will never blow for 0.6 amps. However, if you get around 0.65 amps, which is right here, it may take like 100 seconds. 0.7 amps, which is right here, it will be 10 seconds. So you can see it goes from 10 to 100 seconds in just half an amp. So in this range, it's very questionable about how long it's going to take because it goes, uh, it changes very rapidly for a very small change in current. The time changes rapidly. So you can see a half amp fuse. So here's 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. For a half amp fuse, it will never blow at a half amp. It will never blow at 0 0.6 amps. In fact, it will take at least 0.65 amps for it to blow. So keep that in mind. Um, if you previously believed that a half amp fuse will blow at a half amp, no, it won't. Uh, in fact, it will take substantially more than that to blow. So in this case, it will require at least 130% of the half amp rating to blow or 0.65. And that's a fairly common number. Uh, if you look at the rating, typically it will require like 130 or 150% of that. Keep in mind, if you pay very little for a fuse, what I call junk fuses, this can get thrown out the window, all right? This curve is given by a manufacturer that makes very, it's, it's called Little Fuse. They make very high quality fuses and you can count on their time current curves. When you buy a box of fuses from an unknown manufacturer, they're not gonna give you a curve and it's anybody's guess what the actual characteristic is. So for example, I have uh, a bunch of what I call junk fuses that were very inexpensive, you know, a few pennies a piece compared to a dollar a piece for an expensive one. And my half amp fuse took over twice the half amp rating before it would blow. And in fact, um, here's one amp, which is twice the half amp rating. It never blew after 30 seconds, it never blew. You know, it's anybody's guess with a junk fuse what the operating characteristics is going to be. And I also checked it at two amps and it took about 0.2. So it was different from this fuse. So it can be all over the place for a fuse that doesn't have a time current curve. So just be careful. Don't always assume you're going to get 130% of the rating. It could be, you know, depending on the fuse, it could be anything. There's also, when you come to time current characteristics for a fuse, there's also what's called minimum melt and total clear. And that has to do with the characteristics of the fuse element. This is the fuse that I ran twice its rating or one amp, which is twice a half amp. I ran that for 30 seconds and the fuse never blew, okay? This is that fuse. And you can see it got all black and clearly it was starting to get damaged, but it never blew after 30 seconds of twice rated current. Clearly it is, there's a point at which it gets damaged 
And then there's a point at which it actually opens. And that is defined as the minimum melt time where it starts to get damaged. It starts to melt, but it's still uh, connected between these two caps. It's still a connected wire. And then there's the total clear time, which is the time at which it actually opens the circuit. And that's shown by this kind of gray area where, yeah, it's supposed to go in this time, but actually it's going to start getting damaged here. And actually it's going to actually clear over here. So there's kind of a a region with fuses where you're not really sure um, if it's actually got damaged but not cleared and the other one is it actually opened the circuit. So keep in mind the minimum melt and total clear. Usually you don't have to worry about it. If you need very close tolerances you're going to have to think about this. One more thing to think about is these time current curves assume you are providing continuous current of the exact same magnitude for the entire time. Okay so for example it says uh, at one amp, it will open the circuit. It will blow or melt in one second. Well, that is assuming I am feeding exactly one amp for exactly one second and it will blow. What if I have, maybe I've got a 10 amp burst of current that lasts for five milliseconds and goes away. Is that going to blow my fuse? So for example, in, in one of my other uh, series, I talked about transformers and modeling transformers and what's called the characteristic inrush when you energize a transformer often you will see this big burst of current as you magnetize the iron core of the transformer and um, the question may come well i've got this big huge burst of current that's a lot bigger than my fuse rating is that going to blow my fuse so for example i've got a 117 volt to 12 volt AC transformer on my bench, I can turn it on and measure up to six amps of inrush, this big pulse, um, but the primary is only rated 0.4 amps. So if I put a like a one amp fuse on that transformer and I see this six amp pulse, you may think, wait a minute, that's going to blow my fuse. I got six amps on a one amp fuse. So there has to also be a way of figuring out for, for brief pulses, is this fuse going to blow? The, the good manufacturers provide what's called an energy rating uh, for a fuse. And this is, a, um, this is, I believe, from Little Fuse, where they show what's called the I squared T rating for a fuse. And they apply an 8 millisecond pulse of current and see how long it takes to blow with an 8 millisecond pulse of current. And it's basically what's the total energy going through that fuse in eight milliseconds? Is it enough to melt the fuse? Let's go back. We were talking before about power equals I squared R and total energy is I squared times R times T. However, from a manufacturer's and user's perspective, if you're talking about a particular fuse, you don't care about the R, all right? The R is a value, the manufacturer knows what it is, but what you care about is, in, in our case, I've got six amps going through the transformer for, you know, 10 milliseconds or something. Is that going to blow? I don't care about the resistance of the, of the fuse element. I just care about the peak amps and how long it's flowing for. What they do is they provide you what's called an I squared T and they just ignore the R. So it's the energy through a resistance when you're ignoring the resistance. So from a user's perspective, it's nice. I just say, okay, six amps squared times 10 milliseconds or whatever the time was for the pulse. And that's the total energy. And then they give you a value. In this case, for a half amp fuse, the I squared T is 0.483. So now I can compare my actual I squared T for my pulse with this 0.483 rating. So it makes it nice to know, is my fuse going to blow for that big pulse of current? Here is um, something you can do on your scope to calculate that. So say you've got your, um, you're measuring on your scope the current, and I showed in previous video on transformers, I've got a series on transformers, where we talk about inrush and um, characteristics and modeling of transformers. And we also showed how you can measure the inrush current on your scope. And you can see it's actually a five millisecond pulse but you can calculate the I squared T and match it with the, vent, with what the vendor provides. And this is my actual current reading. And here in blue is the I squared T calculated by the scope. 
And I did another video on I squared T, how to calculate that with a Rigol 1054Z, which is a very popular scope, but it's probably similar with other scopes. And you can see over time it increases and then you get the pulse and suddenly the I squared T goes way up and then it drops, the current drops, so this flattens out and then suddenly you get another pulse. So there's more I squared T, more energy and more energy and it goes up each time you get a pulse. You can calculate the total energy for that inrush of current and figure out if it's below what the uh, manufacturer says. And again, for different size fuses, uh, you've got different I squared T melting values. So very, very important to understand how your fuse responds to brief pulses and currents. Now, like I said, also with my DC power supply, when I turn it on in constant current mode, uh, we showed in the review of this how I can get like an output. When I've got it in constant current mode, I can get this huge burst of voltage coming out of the power supply until it suddenly realizes, wait a minute, it's in constant current mode. I need to drop down to, you know, 0.1 volt, not 14. And it takes about 0.2 seconds to do that. This is a case where this brief pulse of voltage can cause some very high currents to flow in your circuit. And you want to, in this case, make sure that your fuse does blow for this because 14 volts applied to a circuit where you think it's only three volts uh, can be damaging. So here's where you might want to do an I squared T and figure out, okay, what's the current going to flow from this 14 volt pulse? Is it going to blow my fuse? I hope it is because I don't want to damage my circuit. So it's this kind of stuff that fuses are designed to protect against transients that you may not be expecting uh, and you may not even know about. So that's why it's good to be thinking about, hey, there may be other stuff going on. I want to make sure my fuse is sensitive enough to see something like this. We said fuses are for protecting equipment. We showed the power company has got a fuse on their transformer on the pole. Here's a simple diagram of that where I've got a fuse with the transformer. And let's say that transformer has this thermal damage curve where you want to make sure that your fuse blows before any of these points. Like if I have 10 times rated current going through that transformer because of a short circuit, I want to make sure my fuse blows before say 10 seconds. Or if there's two times current, I want to make sure my fuse blows in less than say a thousand seconds. So now we know the fuse has to be sized to be sensitive enough to operate, to blow or melt before your equipment gets damaged. To do that, we're going to have to take a time current curve for our fuse that lies somewhere down in here to give us some margin. So we make sure the fuse blows before the equipment gets damaged, okay? That's a very, very important characteristic of fuses. If you're really protecting some equipment, you need to understand the transformer, what its capabilities are, and you need to size your fuse to make sure that at all points along its capability, you can make sure the fuse will blow first before the equipment gets damaged. So that's what fuses are doing. They are protecting equipment, and that means you gotta understand your equipment if you're really gonna apply the fuse correctly. If you're going to select fuses, you need to have it so it's sensitive to faults. It needs to blow when bad currents are flowing, which means you need to know what bad currents are. How much is a bad current? What are the capabilities of the equipment? Um, we need to be sensitive enough to blow the fuse when bad currents flow, and we need to know what those are. But at the other end, we need to ignore the normal and not harmful currents. So what's normal, right? Rated current, maybe something above rated current is not bad. Like if it's rated at five amps, maybe six amps for a long period of time is not harmful. So you need to be able to know what the normal load current is. And you also need to be able to ignore short duration pulses that aren't going to hurt you. Like energizing a transformer, we saw, we saw like a, a big six amp peak but that's only for five milliseconds. That's not going to damage anything, so we're fine. So we can ignore that short duration pulse. But it needs to be fast enough to protect the equipment, which means we need to understand the equipment capabilities like the thermal char characteristics of the transformer.
but also we need to know that it's, it's slow enough to coordinate with other devices. So for example, if we go back to the fuse on the power transformer in your power company, we don't want this to blow if, for example, one of the customers had a problem at their house and suddenly this guy sees the short circuit through the transformer. We don't want it necessarily to blow the transformer. We want to give the customer's equipment, the circuit breakers or whatever, time to blow or to operate the, the circuit breaker to open up their problem so that we don't cut off all the customers that are being fed by the transformer, okay? So yeah, you wanna be very sensitive, but you wanna make sure that if something else, what's called downstream of this is supposed to operate, this guy needs to wait long enough to allow that downstream device to operate so you don't de-energize or disconnect this transformer and kill everybody's power when it's only one customer that had a problem and their, their equipment was going to uh, clear it. So if you're gonna select fuses, you need to know the fuse rating, uh, you need to know stuff like the time current curve, the I squared T capabilities, and you also need to know about your equipment and what you're protecting and what their capabilities are. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is quality versus junk fuses. Now, I showed an example where quality fuses usually come with good specifications, characteristics, uh, time current curves, I squared T ratings. And you can see with some very good confidence how it's going to react to different currents, how long it's going to take. Um, I showed an example of a junk fuse, which at twice the rating, it still didn't blow. Uh, and it actually got damaged at twice the rating. And also junk fuses have no, generally don't come with time current curves or I squared T ratings or any other information. So keep in mind, if you buy a junk fuse, and I, I bought a bunch of junk fuses, they're, they're okay if you know what you're getting into, um, but just keep in mind that you're not going to get a lot of important information about them. So again, here's my junk fuse, half amp fuse, I put one amp for greater than 30 seconds, still continuous, but it started melting and it was probably damaged, but you may never know, right? It's just sitting there all damaged, you don't know what it's going to do. So here's an example. Um, here is a 250 volt 0.1 amp fuse from a com company called Little Fuse. High quality, very good fuses. Um, this is a dollar for one fuse, okay? However, if you have like what I have, which is this big box of fuses that go from 0.1 up to 20 amps, 250 volts, each fuse is about six cents. So there's a huge difference in price between these fuses. And there's a reason. You can't count on these fuses unless you actually test them. And there's no specs, there's no ratings. Again, you get what you pay for. So it's very important, especially if you're gonna get junk fuses, to know their capabilities and know their limitations and know exactly what you're getting. So you, you gotta study more, you gotta know more if you're gonna apply these, uh, because with these expensive ones, a lot of the work is done for you. Here, you're, you're guessing you're gonna to have to try them out. Now, I wanna talk a bit about fuse myths. There are a few, and uh, again, I think fuses kind of get discarded and people ignore them. Uh, they're kind of an annoyance. The big myth is it's the fuse's fault, right? If a fuse blows, just replace the fuse and you're fine. A lot of people seem to believe that. They think it's a few, fuses are annoying. They, they blow a lot for no reason. Just replace the fuse and you're fine. No, not true. Rarely, I mean, very rarely it can be true. You can have a bad fuse, but very, very rarely. Generally, something caused the large current to flow. The large current that blew the fuse was caused by something in the circuit. The fuse did not blow itself, okay? Either it was damaged previously, like I showed that junk fuse, and we didn't know it, and it was damaged, and it didn't have the capability anymore, and you should have replaced it long ago, and by the way, you should have found out why it had two times rating in it. 99% of the time, something caused a large current to flow in your circuit. You need to find that and fix it first before you even think about replacing the fuse. Very big myth and people seem to believe it and it's just utter nonsense most of the time. There's something went on in your circuit that caused that. Just because you don't know or you don't understand what happened in your circuit, like 
an inrush of a transformer or your power supply generated a big inrush that you didn't expect. You need to understand those things and hook up a scope and find out what's really going on instead of just ignoring it and replacing the fuse. Now, the second myth is any time the current exceeds a fuse's rating, it will blow. A lot of people seem to believe that. They think a half amp fuse where you put a little bit over a half amp, it'll blow. As we showed before, that's just nonsense. It depends. It depends on how much you exceed the rating, the characteristics of the fuse. So like everything else in the world, it's there's no simple answer. It depends. And people seem to think it's a very simple thing. No, it depends on a lot of things. You really need to understand what's going on in your circuit uh, if you're going to use fuses and if you're going to really understand them. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is if you want to measure the characteristics of a fuse, it's kind of difficult in that every time you measure, for example, a point on this curve, you're going to end up blowing a fuse and damaging it. You're going to lose the fuse. So usually the best thing you can, you can try is pick a couple points and kind of make a curve from a couple points. And you're going to lose a couple fuses in the process. But if you want to learn, how, learn the characteristic of a fuse and you can't get a, a printed time current curve, um, what I do is I use a circuit like this. So I've got my DC power supply and have a constant current source. And like I showed before, I will put a constant current source. So depending on the fuse, I will increase this constant current above the fuse's rating to see how long it takes to blow. Now, um, here I've got a little bit different circuit than I had before. What I do is I put in a half ohm high watt resistor series with a fuse and I will also put a power switch across both devices and normally I will start with the switch closed so the constant current DC is going through the switch and not through the resistor and the fuse but it's going through the switch when I turn this on in case there's any pulses coming out of the DC power supply it will go through the switch and not damage the fuse. So it'll go through here and I wait for everything to settle out. Then I open this switch and you can see what I get if I measure across the switch and the uh, resistor and the fuse on a scope. So here is with the switch closed, there's no voltage across the scope leads right here because there's no voltage across this, across this switch because it's closed. So I'll get zero. As soon as I open this, Suddenly, the current will go through the resistor and the fuse. It will generate voltage across this half ohm resistor. So for example, if I've got one amp, it will be half a volt and it will flow through the fuse and suddenly I will get this voltage as the voltage is developed across the resistor. But as soon as the fuse blows, it will open the circuit and suddenly I will have no voltage again and this will go out of constant current mode into constant voltage and it will go back to something near zero. And you can measure the time it took for this current to flow before it blew. So in this case, I've got my half amp fuse. I put in two amps and this took about 0.2 seconds with uh, two amps to my half amp fuse. Of course you blow the fuse, so you're gonna have to you know, sacrifice the fuse each time you wanna do this, but that's just one way to um, do it. Anyway, that's about it for fuses. There's a lot more to go into, but this should give you at least a general idea about what they do and how they do it. Uh, if you like any of these videos, I've got over 160 on various tech topics. So if you like any of these videos, please like, subscribe, hit the bell notifications, and most of all, let others know that we're here so we can get some more viewers. Very much appreciate it. Thanks much. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.